Hello and welcome to South Asia Focus. I'm Smita Prakash. As 2014 draws to a close, here's looking back at the year that was in South Asia. Political changes, trends, natural disasters, terror attacks and more. India and Afghanistan got new governments. Pakistan witnessed a horrible terrorist attack with children gunned down in a school. In Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina's government strengthened its hold. Sri Lanka prepares for elections in January. Nepal hosted the South Asian summit meet and Maldives faced a water crisis as its only desalination plant caught fire. Help came in from India which transported a thousand tons of fresh water and a portable desalination plant. Let's begin with India and its mammoth election. India successfully concluded its huge general election in May 2014 to elect its 16th parliament from 543 constituencies. More than 550 million citizens turned out to vote in a nine-phase election stretching across six weeks. After two five-year terms in the opposition, the Bharatiya Janata Party won with a clear majority, defeating the coalition led by the Congress Party with Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh in the helm. The BJP was led by its Prime Minister candidate Narendra Modi, who decimated the oldest political party in India to a mere 44 seats, the Congress Party's worst ever electoral performance. Narendra Modi, the 63-year-old son of a backward Hindu caste tea seller who rose through the ranks to become Chief Minister of India's Gujarat province for three terms, despite allegations of not doing enough to stem communal violence, which happened under his rule, survived all odds to win this resounding victory for his party. Addressing the people after the triumph in Ahmedabad city, Modi said he would take every citizen on the path of growth and that he needed just 10 years to put India in the driver's seat for high-speed growth. मुझे जन जन को साथ लेकर के विकास की यात्रा में मेरे देशवासियों को जोड़ना है और भाइयों बहनों दुनिया की कोई ताकत नहीं है कि सवा सौ करोड़ के देश को रोक सके भाइयों 21वीं सदी हिंदुस्तान की सदी बनाना है 10 साल चाहिए ज्यादा नहीं चाहिए दोस्तों 10 साल चाहिए देश के अधिकतम मतदाताओं ने डेवलपमेंट के मुद्दे पर वोट दिया है हमारे देश में यह माना जाता था कि विकास के मुद्दे पर चुनाव नहीं लड़ा जा सकता Narendra Modi's contemporary and tech-savvy election campaign virtually met no match in his challenger Rahul Gandhi, the Nehru Gandhi family scion from the Congress party. Even within the party, young men and women are unsure of Mr. Gandhi's leadership skills now. Mr. Modi, in an extraordinary move, later invited leaders of Pakistan and other heads of SARC member nations to his swearing-in ceremony in New Delhi on May 26th. The SARC group consists of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives and Afghanistan, a move hailed by experts as a masterstroke. Mr. Modi has since coming to power looked to strengthen relations with neighbours and other world powers. He has made bilateral visits to Nepal, Bhutan, Australia, Japan and of course the United States, among others. However, relations with Pakistan, even though starting on a bright note with Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif attending Modi's swearing-in ceremony, have gone downhill, with multiple ceasefire violations and border skirmishes dominating headlines. Since the beginning of October 2014, Pakistan and India have been firing mortars and machine guns across the heavily populated border, resulting in highest death toll of civilians in a decade. India maintained that it was Pakistan which had violated the ceasefire and indulged in heavy and incessant firing on Indian border posts and villages and described it as a routine ploy to aid terrorists to cross over from Pakistan into Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan on its part had blamed India for border skirmishes and in an expected move later even approached the United Nations appealing to it to intervene. 
Meanwhile, addressing the country on the 67th Independence Day celebration, the Indian Prime Minister Mr. Modi stressed on cleanliness and need for toilets in every home across the country. Later, a massive Clean India campaign was launched with much fanfare on Mahatma Gandhi's birth anniversary on October 2nd. While India has elected a strong government for political stability, in neighbouring Pakistan, terror and political instability continue to dominate headlines. From the attacks on the media earlier in the year to the continuous protests by cricketer-turned-politician Imran Khan and Canada-based cleric Tahirul Qadri to the horrific terror attacks on the Wagha border and the army school in Peshawar, it has not been a happy year in Pakistan. Pakistan has become one of the most dangerous countries as far as media freedom and bold journalism is concerned. From sectarian extremist groups to the country's inter-services intelligence, ISI, all have continuously targeted the media. Senior journalist of Geo TV network Hamid Mir was shot at in April 2014. While he escaped with injuries, the incident sent shock waves across the country's media circles. Mir blamed the ISI for the attack. Geo News again came under attack in August when a mob of Pakistan Tehrike Insaf workers attacked and ransacked the channel's office. Imran Khan and his party, the PTI, had alleged in May that the general elections were rigged and launched a protest on 14th August 2014. Imran Khan led a rally of supporters from Lahore to Islamabad demanding Nawaz Sharif's resignation and investigation into alleged electoral fraud. Khan led protesters entered Islamabad and camped in the high security red zone of the city. By September, Khan had entered into an unofficial agreement with Canadian Pakistani cleric Tahir ul Qadri, both joining hands in an attempt to oust Sharif who faced immense pressure but was later backed by United Parliament. Imran Khan again launched a shutdown Pakistan protest in December, aiming to shut down major cities till the government heeded to his demands. This time he demanded a judicial commission be formed to look into rigging claims. A commission was formed but Imran Khan later called off protests due to a terrible Peshawar school attack. Meanwhile, two major terror attacks shook the country and raised concerns around the world about Pakistan slipping into chaos. First, the suicide blast on the Pakistani side of the Wagha border, which killed more than 50 people. The outlaw Jundula and the Tehrike Taliban e Pakistan TTP affiliated Jamaat ul Ehrar outfits claimed responsibility for the attack. But the attack that came as a shock to even the Pakistani establishment was the massacre of children by the Tehrike Taliban in Peshawar Army School. More than 140 people, including 132 children, were brutally killed in this shocking incident. The incident enraged the people, with many hitting the streets in protest against the Taliban. It's a very sad thing happened in Pakistan, you know, it should be condemned by international community. Need is, you know, now that the international community should intervene, you know, along with India, another neighboring country. Situation is deteriorating in Pakistan, both political as well as economic. Things are not in control. Government is not in control of the situation. And uh, now the Americans have to withdraw from Afghanistan. So it will spill all over the region. The Nawaz Sharif government swung into action by lifting the moratorium on the death penalty for terrorism cases, thus clearing the way for the execution of dozens of inmates who have exhausted their appeals to be executed. Since then, Pakistan has hanged many prisoners with more executions being planned. In Afghanistan, presidential elections took place in what was a long and wobbly election process. But after a compromise between the two leading candidates, Dr. Ashraf Ghani was elected as the new president, thus beginning a new chapter in post-Karzai Afghanistan. In Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina has further strengthened her position as prime minister and more verdicts in war crimes trial have been announced. While in Sri Lanka, President Rajapaksa gears for elections early next year.
Presidential elections were held in Afghanistan in April and then a second round took place in June. The results of the first round showed that the national coalition's Abdullah Abdullah and independent candidate Ashraf Ghani won neck-to-neck -neck with Abdullah poised to win. But after the second round, Ashraf Ghani emerged as the winner amidst allegations of election fraud from Abdullah Abdullah. The subsequent deadlock was finally broken, with Ghani and rival Abdullah Abdullah signing a power-sharing agreement in September to form a national unity government, thus ending a long period of political squabbling. The agreement made Ghani president and created a chief executive position similar to that of a prime minister for Abdullah. However, the two leaders are still struggling to agree on a cabinet. Negotiations are ongoing between the two sides to resolve the differences and set up the cabinet on time. Ghani, though, has made bilateral trips to Pakistan and China and also took part in the SARC summit in Kathmandu. Bangladesh saw some significant developments as far as the 1971 war crimes trial is concerned. On 2nd February, Jamaat e Islami leader AKM Yusuf, who was also on trial for crimes against humanity, died in prison. Similarly, another senior Jamaat leader, Ghulam Azam, died of a stroke in prison on the 23rd of October. Meanwhile, more Jamaat leaders, Motiur Rehman Nizami and Mir Qasim Ali, were sentenced to death for their involvement in the genocide. Also in December, a former minister during the military rule, Sayyid Qasir, was also found guilty and sentenced to death. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina had set up the War Crimes Tribunal in 2010 to look into the genocide during the 1971 Liberation War. Prime Minister Hasina, who is in her third term in office, also governed without problems despite the controversies being thrown at her by the Khalida Zia-led Bangladesh National Party opposition. Down south in Sri Lanka, the ever-powerful President Mahinda Rajapaksa saw his popularity diminish with the opposition uniting to fight him out in the upcoming elections on January 8th. An election that if he wins could secure him a mandate to 2022. But the united opposition's Maitripala Sirisena is gaining ground as he accuses Mahinda Rajapaksa of being a soft dictator. According to New York Times' Ellen Barry, the challenge to Mr. Rajapaksa is being watched closely by officials in New Delhi and Washington and Beijing who view this island as a strategic foothold in the contested maritime territory. The Himalayan Kingdom of Nepal successfully hosted the South Asian Regional Cooperation Summit meet, which was attended by heads of governments of all SARC nations, though not much headway was made in the summit meet. Bhutan played host to the Indian Prime Minister, who made the tiny Himalayan country as the first foreign destination he visited after taking office. He was also quick to direct aid towards Maldives, which faced a drinking water crisis when its only desalination plant caught fire. India rushed a thousand tons of water and shipped a portable desalination plant. 2014 has been both politically and socially a tumultuous year for South Asia. New governments in India and Afghanistan, the losing battle against the Taliban in Pakistan and Bangladesh moving another step towards closure for justice of 1971 war victims. It was an eventful year. That's all we have for you this week. Thank you for watching South Asia Focus. We hope to continue bringing you news and views from South Asia in the year 2015. I'm Smita Prakash, signing off. Goodbye.